the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So my temptation is to give you all a triptych of the last two weeks, uh, but since this is a major feast in the life of the church, the day of Pentecost, uh, I'll have to at least blend it into a sermon uh, about what it is to be people filled with the Spirit, the body of Christ, given that gift of the Holy Spirit to go out into the world and to transform the world. But I might be able to give you a little bit of what the Holy Spirit or this day looks like through the eyes of someone uh, who has just come back from Jerusalem. So the first thing uh, that struck me is that this story that we have today, the story of the gift of the Holy Spirit, is a story that undoes a story farther back in time. And in some ways, I feel like my journey and the journey of so many others has been sort of the third story. So the first story, which is in Genesis, is a story about a people who got so confident in themselves, so convinced that they didn't need God, so convinced that they understood all of what it was to be human, that they could even reach the height of God, that they could become godly. And so they started to build a tower to the heavens to show that they were in no need of God, that they had everything they needed. And so they built and they built and they built and they built until God realized they had lost an appreciation and a need for God. And God said, in order for you all to understand your dependence upon God, that God is the lifeblood of you. You need to divide. You need to go out into the world. And he made them so that they all spoke different languages. And the Tower of Babel was never complete. And then we have this story, the story that we celebrate this morning, where everything is brought together, where we are one, where we are united, despite all of our different languages, despite all of the things that divide us, that the gospel, that the one who came, drew all of us to himself gift of the Holy Spirit gave those disciples the ability to speak in all of the native tongues of those who gathered around. Now, one interesting thing about this is that I actually got to stand in the room uh, where they believe this might have taken place, uh, at least in Luke's version, and it's uh, the only description is that it was an upper room, and they associate it with the same room as the Last Supper. Uh, and I was fairly confident when standing in this room that this was not the very room uh, that the disciples were ever in, uh, partly because the architecture was about 700 years later. I, even I knew that. Uh, my traveling companion, Paul, thought it was an extra Sunday school room that they saw an opportunity to make some money off of. Uh, but at very least, we were standing in the place that people for hundreds of years have gone uh, and it's worth noting that the other events that are going on are part of the story. Pentecost is not a Christian holiday unto itself. Like many of our other holidays, we took it from another tradition. Uh, as our Passover story uh, was the background for, Easter, uh, for our Easter story, uh, this also is 50 days later. And in the Jewish tradition, Pentecost uh, was a major feast where they celebrated with thanksgiving publicly uh, the Passover experience by taking that harvest and by gleaming those first fruits, that 10%, and, and giving it to the poor. So they were gathered from all around uh, to, to give their offerings to the poor, to, to, uh, uh, to make their sacrifices at the temple. So there were people who spoke so many different languages uh, gathered around this central hub of Jerusalem. And in that context, the disciples who've been <coughs> confined based on their own fear and their own uncertainty about what resides outside these walls are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and they pour out of the room and they go with boldness, a boldness we haven't seen since, a boldness they hadn't experienced before. They step out from behind Jesus and now they are the church. And they go boldly and they preach in all of the languages. And it's not just about being able to speak in different languages. It's about being able to be understood and to understand people who are different than themselves. Of taking those, those lines in the sands that we've talked about in weeks past and knocking them out. Starting over with a sense of a God that is ever expansive. That puts no dividing line never says you're too different to belong to this group. And 
so with daring they go out filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the gospel, we understand that it's not just that they were ready to go, sort of like that perfect football pep rally uh, where they break out of the locker room ready to go. They were terrified. Jesus is saying, I am going to die, and I am not going to be with you much longer, and you all are going to have to be the church. And the passage before this is the one that we say at most funerals, uh, about Jesus going to prepare a place for you. Uh, and then Thomas saying, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't understand. What are you doing? And now here we have Philip saying, Lord, if you only showed us the Father, we'd understand and we'd have what it takes to do this. And he says, I've given you all you need. And you'll also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to go out and to live boldly and to do things that supersede anything <clears throat> you've seen thus far. Anything you've seen thus far. How boldly can you go out into the world? So in my travels, the third part of the story, so remember the tale about Babel being the first part, and then uh, the Pentecost experience being the second, the third part of the story is to watch all of these people going back to where it all happened. They all departed from Jerusalem to go in all the corners of the world and to spread the gospel, and now from all the far corners of the world, they come back to touch that touchstone it reminds them of where it all started. And one of the amazing things about my trip is the people that I encountered. We were in a church. Just about anything that might have happened in the Bible has four churches on top of it. Uh, it started with one church, and then that church disagreed with another church, so they built another. And then over the centuries, they argue about which church is actually on top of whatever was supposed to happen there. Uh, but one of the most beautiful things is not so much the historicity of it, uh, but what it's meant to all of the pilgrims that have traveled from all over the world for the thousands of years. Uh, and we were in this church, and all of a sudden, as we're taking in the beautiful artwork uh, we hear these pilgrims start to sing, and we recognize the tune, Ode to Joy, and all of a sudden, uh, it's in a language we've never heard, but we knew it so beautifully because it's the tune that just resonates through, uh, and these two opera singers in our group from Germany, tears started to, to spill down their eyes as they'd sung it in so many uh, different capacities, and to hear it in Polish, uh, uh, it just absolutely uh, moved them, and then that night, uh, I went home and I, I, I went back to our place and I got to listen to our, uh, my children uh, with the, the chorales uh, concert sing Ode to Joy in English and thought, uh, what a connection a half the world away. We saw Ethiopians uh, singing with, uh, uh, with, with, with incredible beauty, people from Zimbabwe with, uh, with, with using their bodies as percussion instruments and, and making uh, a beautiful sound so different than our Anglican hymnody. Uh, when we were on the Jordan River, we were by the banks of the river, and we we're renewing our baptismal vows, much as we'll do today in a very state Episcopal way. Uh, as the group next to us, I believe they were Egyptian, uh, entering the water and, and wailing in, in, in ways that I couldn't even conjure my, my, my mouth to move, making sounds, I'd, guttural sounds I'd never heard before, as a full expression of the Spirit just consuming them, as they are baptizing one another in the waters that Jesus was baptized in. Uh, all around the world, people gather by what unites them, by their commonality. And it's a beautiful thing. And it realizes in that moment that all of those divisions have been washed away. But then there are other very concrete, literally concrete, illustrations of the way that we have created division. And so as this is the day we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, one of the things we have to ask ourselves as people of faith, where have we listened to the Spirit? Where have we left ourselves behind to follow where the Spirit is leading? And where has the church or any other religious institution put power, put fear, put anger, hatred, bias in front of ourselves so the Holy Spirit can't, can't permeate us? In the same place, there are incredible barriers to see people praying to a re giant retaining wall between them and their holiest of holy sites. The people of Israel <coughs> having to pray on the other side of a retaining wall to the place where they've known God most pregnantly. To see people who actually are able to go to, the, uh, to, to their, their holy ground there, but unable to even reside in the city with retaining walls that keep them out from the city. And at 8 o'clock, they have to be on the other side, and they're escorted, uh, and they have to go through security gates with machine guns in order to come into their, their town. Jerusalem, the center of all of these religions, uh, 
And one of the uh, most profound pictures that, uh, that just happened by accident uh, is on top of the, the Mount of Olives that overlooks Jerusalem. And it's the place, uh, the site commemorates the place where Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he laments uh, that this is the place that kills the prophets. And as, uh, as the disciples uh, are just, uh, just amazed at the beauty of the temple, uh, he laments the history of Jerusalem and prays for peace, prays viscerally for peace in this place. Uh, and there's a picture from that, that church that commemorates it uh, with the Temple Mount in the background behind the window. Uh, and at the altar, there's a monk uh, preparing the Eucharistic table. And in that, uh, you realize uh, how all of these three religions and all of these three cultures uh, have coexisted and how they've set up barriers one to the other. So I ask us on this, the day of Pentecost, on this, the day that we celebrate all that... Uh, all that the God has given us, all the ways that God has called us to be the body of Christ in the world. How receptive are we to the spirit that always pushes us to go beyond, to go outside ourselves, to go to places that are scary, to places that expand the sacred, that welcome other people in, that shake us up, that take courage and conviction and represent the Christ that promises us this gift will come. One of the most uh, beautiful experiences I had was uh, on my morning runs. I didn't sleep very well while I was there. So I would run uh, as, they, uh, the, as the Muslims would have their call to prayer, which uh, went over the loudspeakers to all of the, uh, all of the residents. So you'd run and you hear these beautiful, uh, these beautiful chants as you ran through the town. Uh, and you would see uh, the, the people in the market setting up and unfolding their goods and, uh, and their grape leaves and their vegetables and their fruits uh, and, their, and, the, and their merchandise. And you'd see people uh, in the, in, uh, you'd go through the, the Jewish section and you'd go through the uh, Armenian section. You'd go through the Muslim section and the Christian section. And you'd see uh, the merchants uh, setting up and you'd come in and you start to realize uh, all of the different peoples that are around there. And you'd start to make connections uh, and, and as I ran one day, uh, I saw someone who looked like she could have been in our youth group, uh, about a teenage uh, girl covered, uh, uh, almost entirely covered, except for a little bit around her face. Uh, and as I, I, I walked by her, um, uh, one of the stunning moments of it is that uh, she waited till I was running right past her. And then she clapped her hands as loud as she could to scare me out of my, and then when I jumped uh, about three feet, she turned away with a smile. and. Uh, whether it was a, a, minus, a small act of rebellion or just the mirth of a 15-year-old girl, uh, you realize the oneness of, uh, of the world. And I sort of felt like in those moments when you'd hear uh, the church bells ringing as the, the Muslims were, were called to prayer and the, uh, the, 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 the Jewish chants at the, uh, at, at, at the, at the Wailing Wall, uh, that it's all there. And it just takes another Pentecost, another movement of the Spirit uh, to break down all of those dividing lines. And I... I pray that we as a church uh, have the courage to, to let the Holy Spirit move us beyond any of the dividing lines that we set up uh, to walk out of here boldly uh, so that people realize that the Spirit has moved us out of these walls uh, and into a place that has no divisions. Uh, so that's my prayer for you on this day of Pentecost.